So we've now proved the classification theorem for the irreducible representations of SC2. Namely, any irreducible representation is isomorphic to sim n of the standard representation for some n, um, where so sim 0 of C2 is just the, taken to be the trivial one-dimensional representation. And sim n C2 has the weight diagram, which is just a string of blobs, uh, one blob for every number n, n minus 2, n minus 4, etc., all the way down to minus n. So what does the weight diagram mean? Remember, this is the uh, decomposition of the representation into eigenspaces for the action of um, H, where H is the matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1 in little sl2c. And the weight here is the eigenvalue that we're labeling the weight space by. So one blob means they're all one-dimensional eigenspaces. So it's also true that any finite dimensional representation of SU2 splits as a direct sum of irreducibles. The proof of this is very similar to the proof for U1, once you understand uh, how to integrate over the group SU2. So I'm not going to prove this um, complete reducibility theorem, we're just going to assume it. Now what I'm going to do in this video is take some examples of SU2 representations and decompose them into irreducible semands. So the first example is going to be C2, the standard representation, tensored with C2. So the way we're going to decompose this is we're going to write down the weight space decomposition of this representation and observe that it looks like this. So it'll have three blobs uh, with weights minus two, zero, and two, and it'll also have another blob of weight zero. In other words, the weight space with weight zero will be two-dimensional, and the weight spaces with weights two and minus two will be one-dimensional each. So inside this diagram, you can see a sort of sub-diagram, just three blobs in a row with weights minus two, zero, and two, and that is the weight diagram of SIM2 C2. And what's left is one blob, which is the weight diagram of SIM0, in other words, the trivial one-dimensional representation C, and this is going to give us our decomposition. So let's see how this works. So here's a basis for this tensor product. I pick a basis for C2, uh, vectors E1 and E2, and then I tensor those basis vectors together so I can get E1 tensor E1, E1 tensor E2, E2 tensor E1, and E2 tensor E2. And I need to figure out how the matrix H acts on these guys. So remember H is um, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So in the standard representation H of E1, well E1 is uh, 1, 0, so that maps to 1, 0 which is E1, so H of E1 is E1, and similarly H of E2 is going to be minus E2 in the standard representation. Now, when I act in this tensor product representation, if this was a group representation, I would act using the same matrix on each of the factors and just tensor them all together. But remember, H lives in the Lie algebra. So I should be thinking about how H acts in the Lie algebra. And remember, if I do that, I'm supposed to use basically the product rule or the Leibniz rule. So for this Lie algebra representation, H acts on the first E1, and we get H E1, and leaves the second E1 alone. And then it acts on the second E1 and leaves the first one alone. This was something we discussed uh, in an earlier video. Okay, but H E1 is E1. So if I add these two terms together, I just get 2e1 tensor e1. So actually, this is an eigenvector for the action of h, and its eigenvalue is 2. So that's giving us this uh, highest weight space with weight 2. OK, let's do h e1 tensor e2. Well, it hits e1, and we get h e1 tensor e2 plus e1 tensor h e2. Well, that's going to be E1 tensor E2 minus E1 tensor E2 because of this uh, HE2 equals minus E2. So those two terms cancel, 
and I get zero. So this is a weight vector with weight zero. It lives in this zero weight space, W zero. Similarly, H E2 tends to E1 is zero, same sort of computation. And, oh, that's, uh, that's supposed to be a two. H E2 tends to E2 is minus two E2 tends to E2. Okay, so we get this weight, sp sp uh, weight space decomposition that I claimed. We get um, in weight two, we get E1 tends to E1. In weight minus two, we get E2 tends to E2. And in weight zero, we get the other two vectors. They span this zero weight space. That's two dimensional. So how do we now decompose this into irreducible representations? Well, we follow the procedure we um, used in the classification theorem. We pick a highest weight vector, uh, highest weight vector. In this case, we're just going to have to pick E1 tends to E1 or some multiple of it. And then we use the matrix Y, which was um, 0, 0, 1, 0. And we act on this vector to produce a uh, sub-representation. So let's call this guy V. So V, Y, V, and Y squared V gives a sub-representation. In other words, they span a sub-representation. That's what we proved when we proved the classification theorem. So that will be something in the weight space with weight 2 something in the weight space with weight zero and something in the weight space with weight minus two because y decreases weight by two every time you apply it. So we get a sub-representation whose weight diagram is exactly the weight diagram of sim 2 c2. And then to get the sort of complementary sub-representation, I claim there is an invariant emission inner product on this representation and we take the orthogonal complement. So this gives us a representation U. Um, now pick um, an invariant emission in a product. We get U dagger is a complementary subrepresentation. And you know, there's only one thing it could be because it's one dimensional. So it has to be irreducible. So by inspection, the weight diagrams for U and U orthogonal complement are the same as for sim 2 C2 and the trivial representation Therefore, by the classification theorem, U is isomorphic to SIM2C2 and U dagger is isomorphic to the standard representation. So that tells us that this tensor product, C2 tensor C2, is isomorphic to this direct sum C, SIM2C2 direct sum, the trivial representation. Now this should not come as a surprise because we defined SIM2C2 as a subrepresentation of C2 tends to C2. All right, that's how we constructed it. It was the sub-representation spanned by E1 tends to E1, E1 tends to E2 plus E2 tends to E1, and E2 tends to E2. And if you check, what is Y V, what is Y of E1 tends to E1? Well, again, Y is going to hit E1 uh, y, remember, is is this matrix 0, 0, 1, 0. So y of E1 is E2. And then y is going to hit the second E1, and we get E1 tends to E2. So indeed, our prescription is telling us exactly that this is the sub-representation we get. So the question is, what's left over? What is this C? Well, it turns out that this C is spanned by the vector... Um, E1 tensor E2 minus E2 tensor E1. This is what's called uh, lambda 2 C2, the um, 
exterior power, the exterior square. Um, so whereas SIM2 was looking at symmetric tensors, Lambda2 is looking at anti-symmetric tensors. So it'll be an exercise to check that actually this vector here, E1 tends E2 minus E2 tends E1, is a sub, it does span a subrepresentation, so it is fixed by all the um, group elements because it's the trivial representation. Let's do another example. I want to do sim2 of sim2 of c2. Okay, so what does this even mean? Well, sim2 c2, I've just seen is, is three dimensional. It's spanned by the vectors, uh, I'm gonna write this E1 squared, E1, E2, and E2 squared. So rather than write this, I'm gonna write this as alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so those will be my three basis vectors for sim2, c2. And sim2 of that, well, in the same way that sim2, c2 was just polynomials in uh, E1 and E2, of quadratic polynomials in E1 and E2, sim2 of sim2, c2 is gonna be quadratic polynomials in alpha, beta, and gamma. So this is spanned by alpha squared, alpha beta, alpha gamma, beta gamma, and gamma squared. Right? Oh, and beta squared. Uh, beta gamma and gamma squared. Okay, so le again, let's calculate the weight space decomposition for these three, now these are six vectors here. Okay, so how does H act on alpha squared. Well, it's going to act on alpha. So we get h alpha alpha plus alpha h alpha. So we get two times, um, well, actually, what is h alpha? Remember, alpha is a weight vector with weight two because e1 squared had weight two. So h alpha equals two alpha. So h alpha alpha is two alpha squared and alpha h alpha is two alpha squared, so I get two alpha squared plus two alpha squared, so that's four alpha squared. So alpha squared is now a weight vector with weight four. Uh, h alpha beta, well, h beta is zero because beta is a weight vector with weight zero. So we're gonna get h alpha times beta plus alpha h beta. That is two alpha beta. So that's a weight vector with weight two. And similarly, we're gonna get the following. So H alpha gamma is going to be uh, zero. Uh, H beta squared is gonna be zero. H beta gamma is going to be uh, minus two beta gamma. And H gamma squared is gonna be minus four gamma squared. So you can check those, you can pause the video and check that for yourself now. So here is the weight space decomposition of SIM2, SIM2, C2. We have weight four, we have one vector that spans this weight space, which is alpha squared. In weight two, we have uh, alpha beta. In weight zero, we have a two dimensional weight space again, spanned by alpha, gamma, and beta squared. In weight minus two, we have a beta, gamma, and in weight minus four, we have gamma squared. So you can see, this is gonna decompose, sim2, sim2, c2 is gonna decompose as sim4, c2, coming from this weight diagram, going from minus four to four, plus what's left is just one dimensional representation in weight zero, which is the, the trivial one dimensional representation. And the argument is exactly the same as before. You start with alpha squared, the highest weight vector. You apply y some number of times, one, two, three, four times, to obtain a basis uh, for sim4c2. 
And then you take the orthogonal complement of that sub-representation with uh, respect to an invariant emission inner product, and you get something, some combination of beta squared and alpha gamma that span a one-dimensional sub-representation orthogonal to this. And I claim that actually this trivial sub-representation is spanned by, well, it has to be some combination of beta squared and alpha gamma. It turns out to be beta squared minus alpha gamma. So this is going to be an exercise, but the idea is as follows. So if you have a trivial representation of the group SU2, then everything in the group acts as the identity. And because the Lie, the Lie algebra is a bit like the logarithm of the group, when you have a trivial representation of the Lie algebra, that means everything acts as zero, right? Because x of zero is the identity. And that's why this is living in a zero weight space, right? So h is acting as zero, but also x and y have to act as zero as well. So it turns out this is the kernel, or this spans the kernel of x acting, acting in this representation in a zero weight space. Um, okay, actually alpha squared is also in the kernel of x, but that's in a different weight space. Okay, so that's going to be an exercise to check that this spans the kernel of x. Um, I just want to finish by saying this quantity beta squared minus alpha gamma looks a lot like another quantity that you're familiar with, which is um, beta, b squared minus 4ac, which also occurs in the context of quadratic equations. Um, right, so as in the, it has a double root if and only if b squared minus 4ac is zero. And these things are related, so I'm going to make another video in which I explain exactly what the relationship between these two is.